very excited to be here, and I'm sorry that I can't wrap this out. <laughs> I'll try my best to convey to you the excitement that this project generated when it first appeared in a class that I taught uh, in 1999. So the class was called Medical Ecology, and it was graduate students, a little bit older than you guys, but same thought process. So what were we trying to address in this class? What we were trying to address was this. It was a problem then, and it's a problem now, and it will be a problem for some time to come. It may be a problem forever, who knows? Climate change has always been with us, always. In fact, it's been without us. It was here a long time before we were even people. So if you look back in history, geologic history, you can see how the climate has changed for millions of years and it's gonna to continue to change. What is the big problem? And I think the biggest problem we identified in this class of mine was what are the causes for the change? Who's doing all of this? And it turns out that we're helping. We're helping it along to change faster than it might have done on its own without our help. So here are the consequences of climate change today. Now this is, a really interesting slide because I made it last week, but just yesterday, um, scientists at NASA came out with a similar prognostication for the world over the next 50 years. They said more floods, more droughts, <coughs> more severe floods, more severe droughts, bigger hurricanes. We may not get more of them, but when we get them, they're gonna be more intense. So was that a good prediction? And the answer is, just this year, these places had their worst floods. And if you're from Texas, you had your worst drought ever. Now that might just be, you know, a perturbation in the weather, or it might be a prognostication of things to come. Texas lost $5 billion worth of crops this year. Four years ago, they lost another $4 billion. So that's, in five years, they've lost almost $10 billion worth of food crops and commercial crops, maybe not consumed by Texans, but certainly somebody got a loss. Someone was suffering that shouldn't have <clears throat> if we could have done something different. Okay, so the question is, what? So if you look at the way farming behaves, just take food for an example. We heard a great presentation earlier about what we're doing to our food supplies and how we're manipulating it and making it more commercial and making it more homogeneous and perhaps losing some of the insight for nutrition and for uh, diversity, to allow people to choose and eat what they want rather than what we tell you to eat. So if you look at the way farming has evolved, by the way, there was no farming 12,000 years ago. Hard to believe, but just a short 12,000 years ago, no farms. Today we farm the size of South America to feed seven billion people. That's an enormous jump in evolutionary trends. That's just like 10,000 years of human history that we invented farming and then everything else happened because of that. So traditional farming has no control over the weather. Even though these bucolic pictures, this one painted by Thomas Hart Benton, shows the verdant landscape being harvested. <clears throat> and we can show you real pictures of that too. Okay, but at the same time, we can use Charles Dickens's words to tell you what's going on in farming today. And if you're a farmer, let's say you're a farmer in New York State. I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of these people. I said, how many good years have you had over the last 20 years? What do you think they said? How many think they said 15? What do you think 10? How many think four? I sort of gave you the answer. <laughs> over the last 20 years. That's not a business model. That's how you go on a business. And in fact, if you read another book that I highly recommend, besides the one I wrote, of course, <laughs> is, and we'll get to that later, uh, it's called The Grapes of Wrath, and a lot of you are familiar with it already. They even made a movie out of it. And it's all about the failure of farming, not the success of farming, the failure of farming. So where do we go? I think we should go indoors, just like we have today. If we had to give this presentation outdoors, I dare say 
it would be a quite a different presentation, right? I would wear something different, so would you. But we protect ourselves from the outside by building these structures so that we can behave comfortably while we try to think our way out of the messes that we've got ourselves into. Here's how to do it. Greenhouses. You think, well, gee whiz, that's the built environment. We're back to factory food. We're back to expenses. And it's only for the rich. And, you know, all those questions came up in the class that I taught over the last 11 years. Everybody had these, these takes on this subject, OK? But the more we examined this, the more it looked as though you, you should at least try it. If someone came up to you and said, you know, we don't know how to fly yet, but I think we should learn. And I think we should invent airplanes. Because that's a great idea. Because then I could go visit my grandmother, who lives in California. And you'd say, man, but airplanes are expensive and they're dangerous. And sometimes they don't fly. But they're worth trying. So if you told that to the Wright brothers, they would have said, sure, we'll do it. So they went all the way from Ohio to North Carolina, just so they could get the wind to try out their idea. Guess who was the first victim of the first airplane crash? One of the Wright brothers. He died. He was the first person to ever die in an airplane crash. The inventor of flight, as we know it today. But it was still worth going forward with. So I think this idea is worth going forward too. So if you'd asked me to do this last year, I would have said, gee, you know, it's too bad. I'd love to show you some examples of this, just to show you that this idea has escaped. So they, they use the expression, the genie is out of the bottle. This genie got out of the bottle a long time ago, about five or six years ago. This is a real vertical farm. It's run by the government of Korea. I had the privilege of being there. You might be able to tell which one I am in this picture. <laughs> I'm the other 20 pounds of extra weight that you were talking about before. That's because I like to eat. And <laughs> not McDonald's, by the way. So, because I like to cook as well. So here I am visiting the world's first vertical farm, run by the government. The government thinks this is a good idea to try. They're not sure if it's going to work. But they're going to try it. Isn't that the whole idea? Of course it is. Only governments can afford this, though, right? Ha! I'll show you some more pictures. It's all LED lighting. It's all self-contained. It's mostly leafy green vegetables. They were delicious, by the way. They didn't have to be washed. They grow clean. They just cut them, bag them, and sell them. Not bad. You avoid a whole bunch of infectious diseases this way. All those diseases in the cattle feedlots, E. coli 0157, listeriosis. I'm trained as a microbiologist, so I tend to drop these names every now and then. But these microbes tend to drop onto our food. So how do you prevent that? Isn't that a problem worth addressing? Sure. So let's prevent it by farming indoors. What about indoor farming? Well, here's a commercial venture in Japan, radiation-free food. Anybody want radiation-free food? <laughs> eat this food first. In fact, eat it last, too. Here's a plant, plant lab uh, version of a vertical farm going underground, three stories underground. What's all that about? That's an upside down vertical farm. But it's going to work because they're using grow lights to grow their food. Here's another one in Seattle about to start. Here's a way we look inside. It's great in there. You can actually walk through and pick stuff and eat it if that's what you really want to do. You can make your own salads as you go to your lunch break. Cool stuff. So the rewards of doing this are, are many. So you can start with restoring our hardwood forest. What happened to the hardwood forests? We turned them into farms. And now, what else has happened? Because we get these horrendous droughts and floods, we get agricultural runoff from the farms. And that all ends up in the estuaries of the world, and it spoils our seafood. The United States imports 80% of its seafood from other countries because our own estuaries don't function properly. Why? Because we've spoiled them with agricultural runoff. You can keep out plant diseases from an indoor farm. Just shut the doors. Treat it like you would a patient in an intensive care unit. That's what your food is worth. If it's worth protecting yourself from the elements by building these wonderful structures, what the heck was wrong with our food? Isn't that worth it? Sure. You can grow food year-round this way. And you can grow it anywhere you want. Anywhere. You can live in Antarctica if you'd like, or you can live in Iceland, or you can live down in Tierra del Fuego. It doesn't matter. There's no soil. You can live in Abu Dhabi. You 
You have food all year round, any kind of food you want. You can rehabilitate urban decay. Big deal for the mayor. You can provide lots of new jobs. I know that doesn't mean much now, but it will. It will. Trust me, it will. Go, go look at Occupy Wall Street and see who doesn't have a job, but who has a good, solid college education. What's wrong with this picture? Lots. We can create the city of the future, which is balanced and doesn't take advantage of nature the way we're doing it now. We can actually give land back and live in peace for once with the uh, elements that actually allowed us to evolve into what we are today to begin with. So if the future of farming is vertical, then the future is now, right now. If you want to learn more about this, I gave three books in the school, and you can have more if you want. Or you're welcome to go buy them. <laughs> Thank you.